Well, today I've got something new in the mail. The X470 Tai Chi from ASRock. This is a really exciting motherboard. I've read good things about it, but I can't wait to put it through my paces and also Linux testing and all that stuff. There's just one problem. I've got my Lee and Lee test bench here. It doesn't have a cooler. I want to test overclocking to the max on X470. I'm going to add a closed loop cooler. So far I've recommended that, you know, the Wraith Prism or whatever the bundled cooler is with your Ryzen CPU is all you need, but I'm going to put it to the test. And for putting it to the test, I've got the Master Liquid ML240R RGB. This is a 240 millimeter closed loop all in one cooler. It comes with a wireless, or I'm sorry, a wired addressable RGB controller. So, and complete RGB illumination. I've already sort of tearing into it, but this is compatible with, you know, 2066, 1150, 1155, AM4, you name it. It's a 220 millimeter fans that are 66.7 CFM. It's about 15 or six to 30 dBA noise level, about 15 dBA nominal on the pump. So it's got some pretty exciting specs, but man, you know, Ryzen does get hot when you overclock it. So let's see what happens. We've got our cooler mounted and our Lee and Lee test bench. It's time for the main attraction. What have I become? In terms of connectors on the motherboard, there is a plurality of fan connectors. There are five in total. Three at the top of the board, one at the front edge of the board, and one along the bottom of the board. There's also a plurality of digital LED connectors, as well as the standard 50-50 header at the bottom edge of the board, around the CPU socket, in case you're using an RGB cooler for your CPU, and I think that's it. In terms of RGB connections, the motherboard has two analog, two digital headers. One of the analog connections is really meant for the CPU, so it's really two digital, one analog, but you've got analog and digital at the bottom here. Analog, of course, being your 50-50 LED strip, and digital being your digitally addressable LED strip. In terms of power input, it has a massive overkill, one eight pin and one four pin. This is an 18 phase power delivery system, I believe, on this motherboard, which, you know, with the current generation Ryzen 2000 series CPUs, you're not gonna be dumping more than 200 watts into that Ryzen 7, you know, 2700X, unless you've got liquid nitrogen cooling, so. The VRM on, on most of these is pretty overkill, but hey, maybe it's future-proofing. Time will tell. At the bottom edge of the motherboard, we also have two more USB 2.0 headers for any accessories that you might run, front panel connections, and front panel audio. In terms of PCI Express layout for this motherboard, it has two by 16 slots that can run it by eight by eight, wired directly into the CPU. It has one armored M.2 slot, which is PCI Express 3.0 by four, directly into the CPU. And it has one additional M.2 slot, which is PCI Express by four 2.0 into the chipset. There are also two PCI Express by one connections into the chipset and one PCI Express by four slot into the chipset. Do note that if you use the second M.2 with PCI Express by four, it will disable the PCI Express by four uh, slot on the bottom, which is run through the chipset. Here's what we're dealing with for rear I.O. At the back of the motherboard, we've got our dual Intel 802.11ac wireless solution, combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port, two USB 3.0, it's USB 3.1 Gen 1, the protocol, CMOS reset button, HDMI out for CPUs that have integrated Vega graphics. So, you know, Ryzen 5G, Ryzen 3G, something like that. Then next to that, we've got our Intel Gigabit NIC, just below that, our USB 3.1 Gen 1 connectors. And then we've got our four USB connections through, you know, the external as media controller, two USB 3.1 Gen 2, 10 gigabit per second, one type A, one type C and two more USB 3.0, USB 3.1 Gen 1, the protocol. Then we've got our Realtek ALC 1220-based audio codec that has an optical SPDIF output. And then we've got 7.1 analog out, gold-plated, reinforced, et cetera, et cetera. Front panel audio connector, isolated part of the PCB confirmed. We've got the you know audio grade, audio capacitors, gold audio capacitors. And the implementation is 123 dB signal to noise ratio. Includes a front panel connector with auto sensing, uh, auto impedance. For our front panel connections, we've got eight six gigabit per second SATA ports, four USB 3.0, one here, one here, can't see that, one USB Type C front panel audio connector. 
There are two USB 3.0 headers, USB 3.1 Gen 1 for your internal case, as well as a USB Type-C header for your front panel. That wraps up the tour of the motherboard. Let's get it mounted in our Lee & Lee test bench. Now for our CPU that we're gonna be using, it's gonna be a Ryzen 7 2700 Non-X. Now the Ryzen 7 2700 Non-X does not clock as high as the 2700X. We're talking about a you know 20 megs of cache, 4.1 gigahertz max boost, 3.2 gigahertz base versus the 3.7 gigahertz base that you get on the 2700X. But I'm gonna start with the 2700 and see how far I can push it with the Cooler Master all-in-one cooler and then we'll swap for the 2700X and see how that does. So what a curious result from our testing. When we use Ryzen Master to overclock the 2700 CPU, when we push the CPU to 4250 and an insane 1.55 volts, even backing off that to like 1.47 volts, but only 4250, 4350 on two cores, on the two best cores on the CPUs as marked in Ryzen Master, we actually significantly regressed our performance. 4.2 gigahertz all core overclock across the board. Stable, seems to work fine. Even a DDR4 3400, which is kind of nuts. I mean, you think about the Infinity Fabric and all the stuff that's going into Infinity Fabric and the rest of the machinery of the CPU and how fast that's running. That's honestly a very surprising result for our eight core 2700 CPU. That's the non-X version. How interesting. Now, in terms of the rest of the testing and the, the rest of the stuff with the CPU, yeah, of course, the 2700X is gonna be faster. If you do the B-clock overclocking, well, uh, you can get around 4.5 gigahertz. Some instability creeps in with, with that sort of stuff. There's not really a lot in the ASRock UEFI yet for Precision Boost 2 or any of the extra you know, special sauce that, that AMD is working on, or Precision Boost Overdrive 2, I should say. Uh, in terms of pushing past it, because I'd love to be able to set the TDP on the CPU from 65 watts to like mm, 200, and then just let the CPU figure it out on its own. But as it stands, a 4.2 gigahertz all core overclock on the 2700 is pretty darn good. And so for our memory testing, just to real, really quickly run through it, with the um, G-Skill Trident Z memory, 3600 and 3400 were no problem. The 3400 Sniper X kit, uh, it, it's basically a no-brainer, like 3200 or 3400, if you can possibly do it on Ryzen, you should totally do it. In our worst case, you know, grueling scenario, where we throw two Vengeance uh, LPX DDR4, these are two four gig sticks, mixed in with our two eight gig sticks from from G-Skill, I mean, it's like we're mixing brands, the memory, the command rate's different. It's pretty much a worst case scenario. Normally out of the box, Ryzen runs at 1866 when you're working with four sticks of memory, which is uh, pretty pokey. But with this configuration in this setup with the uh, 513, yeah, there's a, there's a BIOS from 513 or 1.35A. So 1.35A on the Tai Chi X470, with all of the other stuff that I just said about the memory, we're talking 2400 stable, 2666, I could probably dial it in to be stable, but I did have to bump up the system on chip voltage to 1.05 to 1.1 volts. Probably could play with that a little bit more and get it stable, but if you just want, you know, plug and play operation, you can probably dial it in, you know, 2400, maybe 2666 if you're pretty lucky. Uh, our DDR4-4000 kit, no DDR4-4000. DDR4-3800, not 100% stable, but the situation did improve with the 1.35A Agiza update. So I think that's probably down to Agiza. I think your 24-7 stability on this uh, is probably like 3600 across the board. You might be able to do 38 even, but the 3866 or whatever the option was, that was not that was not overnight stable. So your mileage may vary. My best CPU Z score is not the CPU Z is any great benchmarking utility, but it was 5200 
all eight cores and 480 for a single core speed, which is pretty good. I mean, the 2700X, my best was like 500, 510, and my all core speed was basically the same. So in terms of all core speed, the 2700 is matching the 2700X. The 2700X for the extra $30, you get the higher single core, low core count clock speeds, which helps in games. And that's pretty much it. In terms of Linux support, well, it's an Intel NIC, so, you know, Intel NIC, Intel Wireless, all the Linux support ticks all the boxes. Uh, all the onboard peripherals work the way that you would expect with Linux. You know, do note that you, if you use the second M.2, it disables the bottom slot. There are two PCI Express by one slots, which have an open end on them, so you could run, you know, PCI Express by two or four peripherals in those PCI Express by one slots. Pretty much all of the, um, the devices that go through the chipset are grouped together in one IO MMU group, which is pretty much the same across the board for what we've been seeing in these X470 chipsets. But if you run the NVMe that goes directly to the CPU and you run two graphics cards or two PCI Express devices that are directly to the CPU, all of those devices will be isolated into their own IO MMU groups. That's pretty good. I mean, we've really improved the situation you know, just a couple of years ago, it's like you'd have to wait a year for Linux support, and now good Linux support is basically shipping. It kind of makes sense because, again, X470 is really an incremental refresh of X370. Uh, you know, is there anything that would make you run out and abandon the board that you've got now? Well, no. But, uh, you know, other than that, it's still a really solid board. ASRock has only improved on the X370, it, it seems like, in terms of just polish and experience and stability, that kind of thing. Trying a first gen Ryzen 1700 CPU on this, pretty much the same experience that we've had on other X470 boards. There's not a lot of data points here. It's hard to test X470. There's just so much that goes into it. It's crazy. Well, I'm Wendell. This is level one. If you're new here, you should subscribe and hit the bell and do all that. This was a you know, total snooze fest and I drone on and on and on in a monotone voice. Well, I'm working on that. Uh, and so engage and encourage, I don't know. You can find me hanging out in the level one forums. I'm signing out and I'll see you there.